Show me the money. Hey, um. Hey, um. Hey, um. hey, it's me. Knock, knock. So, uh, you got, uh, you got my money? Think about it. You're dealing with numbers all day long. Decimal points, high frequencies, bang, bang, bang. Digits. All very acidic, above the shoulders, mustard shit. Right? Kind of wake some people out. Right? You gotta feed the geese to keep the blood flowing. I keep the rhythm below the belt. I wanna stay in Arizona. I want my new contract. Show me the money! Jerry, you better yell! Show me the money! Where's my money? You gonna give me my money? Where's my money? Jamal Adams got paid. The Seahawks threw down, opened the checkbook, and made him the most highly compensated safety in all of the NFL. He is a huge cap consideration for them for the next two, three, four years. We've already seen the fallout of this move with Harrison Smith and the Vikings. Or have we? Welcome to Cap Strapped. I'm Max Dean, and this is our salary cap show here at Pan Am Football. You can find me on Twitter, at Pan Am Football. Now let's dive into Jamal Adams, Harrison Smith, and the 2021 and beyond safety market. So the first thing that we're going to do here quickly is just take a look at how the safety market has developed over the past three years or so. We're going to look at three off-seasons, 2019, 2020, and 2021. And I'm not going to look at every single safety, just the ones who are right up at the top of the market. So we had, back in 2019, Landon Collins signed as a free agent with the now Washington football team. Uh, he's now 27 years old. He signed for $14 million per year on a six-year contract as a free agent. Uh, that was considered a monster contract at the time, but it was quickly matched by uh, Tyron Matthew with a much shorter length of contract, only three years. Also a free agent, he uh, basically had just rehabilitated his value with the Texans on a one-year deal. Just keep in mind that the age that you're seeing is their current age, um, because I want to look at that in a minute. Next up, we had Kevin Byard signing a five-year extension with one year remaining uh, with the Tennessee Titans in 2019. He went for $14.1 million, just beating out Collins and Matthew. The following offseason, very early in the offseason, Eddie Jackson signed a four-year extension with the Bears, with one year remaining for $14.6 million. So he beat out that market by $500,000. Later in the offseason, Buda Baker, who is now 25, signed an extension, four years, one year remaining, same situation, for $14.75 million per year. So he, again, reset the market, but not by a whole lot, still just jumping up by small margins here. Now this year, the Broncos got Justin Simmons locked down, for a four-year contract worth $14.25 million per year. He had one year remaining, although it was on a franchise tag, so this basically steps in in place of the franchise tag. Um, so a little bit of a different situation. They got it done before Jamal Adams, which was a good move because, as you'll see, that is going to push the entire market forward substantially. Now, a couple of weeks ago, the Seattle Seahawks signed Jamal Adams to a four-year extension for $17.5 million per year with one year remaining. I made a video a couple of months ago in which I looked at the financial implications of trading multiple first-round picks for a player. And although everyone kind of anecdotally says, oh, it puts you in a bad negotiating position, I really wanted to break it down and, and look at how much of a jump it tended to make in the market. So we looked at the Khalil Mack situation, where the Bears traded two first-round picks for him. He jumped the market substantially, and he held the number one uh, most well-compensated player at his position for, I think, three years uh, through 2018, 2019, and 2020. It wasn't until 2020 until he was beat out. Uh, then I took a look at the Laramie Tunsil situation going to the Texans. He jumped the uh, uh, the left tackle market um, by quite a bit, 
um, and he jumped the entire tackle market by $4 million per year. He did end up getting beaten out later that year, uh, last year in 2020, by David Bakhtiari. Um, so it wasn't that long until he was beaten out. Then the Jalen Ramsey contract, that jumped the corner market by a couple of million dollars as well. He is still the most highly compensated corner, although it is not by a substantial margin. So we've seen two things happen. We've seen teams say, we're not getting anywhere close to that. That's an outlier situation. And we've also seen teams say, uh, yeah, we're going to get you there or close to it or just beat it out as well. So it's hard to say exactly what will happen with this safety market. But the final safety that we have to take a look at here is Harrison Smith signs an extension with one year remaining at age 32 for $16 million per year. Now, if you look at that, that would suggest on face value that the safety market has jumped with Jamal Adams. Because a player at age 32 generally would not come in at the second most highly compensated, especially at uh, three quarters of a million increase over the next highest player who signed only uh, a few months ago himself. And that would be Justin Simmons, who I'm referring to. But we're going to look at everything just a little bit more closely and see why these contracts are uh, wildly different in nature. So as we look at Jamal Adams here, he signed a monster, monster contract. Now this is a seriously big time deal. He signed a four-year contract worth $70 million, so $17.5 per year. Um, according to my math, he had about $10.44 million remaining, uh, which was a result of his fifth-year option. So currently, everything you see here totals $80.44 million, but it's $70 million in new money. And there are also some... Um, uh, incentives he can earn on top of that, um, but as of right now, I think they're they're considered to be not likely since he hasn't done them before. So we're going to call year zero, uh, 2021, because that was the final year that he was already under contract, the previous fifth year option. He gets a $20 million signing bonus, as well as $1 million base salary. So the Seahawks generally, uh, their guarantees only, like their, their tendency is to only guarantee signing bonus and first year base salary. So that's $21 million fully guaranteed at signing. He also gets all $21 million of that in the first year. Considering 10.44 uh, of that was already, uh, basically he already had it coming to him. It's not considered new money. So in year zero, he gets an additional $10.56 in new money before the first extension year even starts. If you look at the signing bonus here, the $20 million is split equally over the five years. That's the proration, meaning the $4 million of 2021 and the $1 million base salary of 2021 totals a cap hit of $5 million. Looking one year down the line, he has an option bonus of $12.44 million and a base salary of $2 million. The option bonus is guaranteed for injury and will guarantee a couple of days, I think five days after the Super Bowl of 2021. The, the 2021 season's Super Bowl, I should say. Which means... It's, it's effectively guaranteed, even though it's not fully guaranteed at signing. It's extremely, extremely, extremely unlikely that the Seahawks would release him after that. Meaning that the additional uh, $2 million base salary and option bonus are effectively guaranteed for him as well. That means that he earns $14.44 million in, uh, in, in money, in cash, in 2022, which is the first year of the extension. And that's also a total of $25 uh, million dollars in new money in the first by the end of the first extension year, if that makes sense. So what that means is one year into the extension, the actual extension, he's earned $25 million in new money. So if you look at it that way, uh, if he were to be released at that point after that year, 
it would be a one-year extension worth $25 million per year, right? So you can see it's extremely unlikely that the Seahawks would let him go at that point. The next year after that, he has an $11 million base salary, uh, 2.56 of which is guaranteed for injury and will become uh, fully guaranteed again a few days after the Super Bowl of the 2022 season. Um, and that is the entirety of what he earns that year. So he only earns $11 million in the second uh, extension year. Now, as a result of the proration and, and the big upfront money that he got, he does have a cap hit of $18.11 million, but his actual earnings that year are, are significantly less. And then in total, that's $36 million of new money over the first two years. So that would be $18 million per year. Year three of the extension, which would be 2024, he has a $16.5 million base salary, uh, which is the entirety, again, of his earnings that year, unless he hits the incentives. And with his signing bonus and option bonus, that's a $23.61 million cap hit. So upon completion of year three, that's the first time that his uh, per year earnings actually drop down to 17.5 for a year because 52.5 million that he's earned over those first three years divided by three is 17.5. So that's the first time that we actually hit what the average per year really is. Over the course of uh, year four, he has a base salary of 17.5 uh, million and no additional earnings on top of that. So a couple of things when you look at this. One, it is a ton of early money. Like I said, 25 million in new money over the first uh, extension year, 36 million in new money over the uh, first two years. And then on top of that, 21 million fully guaranteed at signing plus the additional 14.44 million uh, effectively guaranteed at signing, it, it, it really shows you that 17.5 is the actual value of this contract. So I'm going to give you just a couple of hypotheticals of what it would look like if they had to release him at some point and, and basically how committed the Seahawks are to this player. If they released him following the 2024 season, the 2025 cap hit for him would be $7.11 million. But that would all be dead money, and it would not be any additional payments. They wouldn't have to pay him anything at that point. So it's a bit of a dead money hit, but it's very feasible for them to do that if they wanted to. If they wanted to release him following the 2023 season, again, they would not have to pay him any additional money. And the cap hit for him would be $14.22 million. Uh, again, that's just dead money from proration. They could release him after June 1st that year if they wanted to, uh, which would spread out the cap hit, meaning that he would have basically 7.11 in 2024, 7.11 in 2025. But they would be able to do it either way, depending on what their preference was for, for cap considerations. Now, if they wanted to release him after the 2022 season, they would have to do it uh, before June 1st, because he would have further guarantees that would kick in if they decided to keep him on the roster. However, they also would have paid him essentially $25 million for the 2022 season. And so that's extremely unrealistic. So you're looking at Jamal Adams being with the Seahawks through at least 2023 worst case scenario, and it's clear that their intention is that He's there even a little bit longer. So now let's compare Harrison Smith to that. Harrison Smith has been getting a lot of praise for this contract. Um, what a good deal it was for a player in his situation. Now, I will say this. That it, it, it really has some merits. But when you see how dramatically different the contract actually is to Jamal Adams, you'll see that in reality, it's... It's, it's really basically just a one-year extension. And then there are team options after that if they want it. All right, let's look at Harrison Smith's contract from top to bottom. 
everything you see here totals $74,829,412. And that includes the money that he still had coming to him uh, that he was under contract for in the 2021 season. His extension was four years, $64 million, averaging $16 million per year. The $10.829 million remaining, uh, if you remove that, uh, then essentially in year zero, he gets new money worth $3.75 million. So he gets a, a little raise, whereas Jamal Adams got upwards of $10 million in new money in year zero. Harrison Smith gets uh, $3.75 million in new money in year zero. So the way that breaks down is a $9.579 million signing bonus spread out evenly over the length of the contract, then uh, a $1.75 million base salary, and a roster bonus worth $3.525 million. So those are all fully guaranteed. He also has 300000 in per-game roster bonus money and 100000 in workout bonus money. Now, that $300,000, uh, $300, the way that works is it's split evenly over all 17 games. And every game that he is uh, on the active roster for, that is uh, he gets the 117th of that. So he could earn up to 300000 if he plays in every game. But he also could earn less depending on how much time he misses. Looking at year one, which is 2022, he earns $11.55 million that year. $2.95 million is the base salary. He also has a roster bonus of $8 million and additional per game roster bonuses and workout bonuses. In the italics there, that means that it is guaranteed for injury only and will be guaranteed fully at some point in the first few days of the new league year of 2020, 2022, excuse me. So whereas Jamal Adams had earned $25 million in new money in the first new year of the contract, Harrison Smith has earned $15.3 million. If Smith is on the roster for 2023, he will earn $14.7 million in base salary. And then again, the per game roster bonuses and the workout bonuses, and that will total $15.3 million again. So $30.6 million in new money over the first two years means $15.3 million. So if you see a little trend here, he actually earns $15.3 million after the first new year, another $15.3 million after the second new year. In the third new year, he earns $14.45 million in base salary, but again, due to per game roster bonuses and workout bonuses, he will end up earning $15.3 million that year as well. So he essentially has $15.3 million coming to him in 2022, $15.3 million in 2023, and $15.3 million in 2024 uh, each. So when you look at that, that's telling you that's a $15.3 million contract. That's what it is. When you get to 2025, he earned $17 million in base salary and uh, $1 million in uh, uh, per game roster bonuses plus workout bonus. So that's $18.1 million per year. And it would be extremely likely and easy for the Vikings to cut him at that point. Remember, he's 32 right now. So going into the 2022, he'll be 33. Going into 2023, he'll be 34. Going into 2024, he'll be 35. I highly doubt the Vikings will pay a 36-year-old safety $18 million. Especially when they have no financial commitment to that player. So what that tells me is that last year, that's really just put in there to boost the average annual salary so it looks higher. Everything else you see here says this is a $15.3 million contract. So let's look at it and just see what it would cost them to release him at various years as we go, just so that you can really see the breakdown of it. If they release him prior to that final season, like I was just talking about, they would only have $1.915 million 
in dead money, essentially. And again, that is just prorated dead money, so it's not additional money that they would have to pay him. If they released him following the 2023 season, they would only have $3.831 million in dead money. Again, that is uh, only prorated dead money, no additional uh, cost dead money. And if they wanted to, they could do June 1st, where that's split in half over 2024 and 2025. However, by the time 2024 rolls around, $3.8 million is going to be a very small part of the cap, especially when dead money is concerned. So it will be very, very easy for that release to happen if they so chose. If they decided to release him following the 2022 season, which is after the first extension year, they would have $5.74 million in dead money. And again, purely proration dead money. No additional payment. Now, they couldn't June 1st cut him because he does have the additional guarantees that would kick in uh, if he was on the roster that long. But again, this is very, very reasonable to deal with if you're the Vikings organization in terms of dead money. So really, when you're looking at this, he gets $15.3 million for one additional contract year in the actual money that he earns. So when you look at Jamal Adams, not only is not only is the uh, average per year significantly higher, the investment is significantly higher, and the amount that he gets early in the contract is much, much higher. Now, everyone's saying what a good contract this is for Harrison Smith. I'll say it's it's a positive because the 2022 money is guaranteed for injury and he gets a little bit more money right now. But ultimately, there is very little that he's guaranteed if he just doesn't play that well. If he doesn't play very well and they decide to release him, as long as he's not hurt, he basically just got a little raise this year. He got... I believe what sums up to about a three and a half million dollar raise. And so I just don't see what all the hype is about for him. I mean, he has no guarantee for anything except for getting hurt. And even that that guarantee, it really just lasts the one year. And the an- average annual value is not as high as people are making it out to be. This is just a perfect example of how good the Vikings front office is at basically uh, getting guys at really good value. And in a way, this is just doing right by Harrison Smith because at his age, why would you ever give him a contract that contains substantial investment, uh, you know? For a a guy that's going to be 33 going into next season and then 34 going into the year after that, I'm not saying he's for sure going to be cut, but you want the option if necessary. So I like it for him in the sense that he does have injury guarantees going into 2021. Um, You know, because if he was going into a a free agency next year and he ended up getting hurt this year, that would be really rough for him. You know, so so that level of of guarantee is, is good. But just the way that people have been presenting it, it's it's just not that. So if we re-examine our safety market here with the the more realistic version of what Harrison Smith's contract is he only beats out Justin Simmons by about 50,000 and it's really more like a 3 year extension because again I just don't see them carrying him for that final year that's really like funny money in in the truest sense of it for uh for NFL contracts when you look at that it suggests that maybe the market is not uh, advancing as rapidly as as you might think when you see a 32-year-old 32, 32 safety getting a $16 million per year contract. So the guys that are going to be coming up for extensions within the next season, so basically a year from now, all of these guys will get new contracts in some way, shape, or form. Tyron Matthew is 29 now. He'll be 30 next year. He has one year remaining with the Chiefs. He is extension eligible, which means he can sign an extension anytime. But due to his age, 
stature and extremely physical play style, I would be very hesitant to lay down a large extension for him. Um, I would love to have him on my team. He's a good player, but I just don't think that massive financial commitment to the level of Jamal Adams is the wise way to go for him. The Chiefs may just go for it because he's been such a big part of their Super Bowl runs past couple of years, but I kind of feel like they would have done it by now if that was the way that they were going to go. Marcus Williams and Marcus May are both franchise-tagged players this year. They came into the league at the same time. Um, this is going to be their fifth year, both of them. They are not extension eligible because they have. Uh, it is past the date at which ex- uh, uh, franchise players can sign extensions. So the only way they can sign extensions are after the regular season before free agency starts. Marcus Williams, I don't think that's going to happen for. I think he's probably going to be a free agent for a couple of reasons. One... If he makes it that far, he'll still only be 26 going into next year, so he's prime age for a big-time contract. Uh, And he'll know that teams will be willing to shell out, so he'll probably wait it out a little bit and, and see what the open market offers him. And the reason that the Saints won't uh, make a strong enough offer to potentially just lock him down is because they have to deal with Marshawn Lattimore, who will be a free agent this coming season uh, if they don't get something worked out with him. So if that doesn't happen, they're going to need to use the franchise tag on Lattimore because they're not going to want to let him go. And they also have to consider Terran Armstead at the left tackle position as well. So to me, as good of a player as Williams is with number one corner and left tackle kind of impending, he's going to have to be kind of the, the the third priority. And Marcus May, he's just a little too old, I think. Plus there's also a possibility that uh, he came into the league a little bit older. There's also the possibility that the Jets can franchise tag him again. They have a ton of cap space, and I think they're probably comfortable doing that, um, you know, if he has a good year, because it's just the, the, the less you have to commit to a player, the better off you are as a team, you know, the better position you are in. So, you know, if they have good safety play with the younger guys, maybe they let him go. Um, but I just think that, there's a good chance he could be franchised a second time, and even if not, I just don't see the league going to the Jamal Adams level. Now, Derwin James and Minka Fitzpatrick, on the other hand, are two players who came in as first-round picks in 2018. They both have two years left, uh, and that includes the fifth-year option for both of them. Now, if they both stay healthy, in particular Derwin James, I absolutely could see this being a situation very similar to what we saw with Fred Warner and Darius Leonard this past offseason, where basically you know that both of them are going to take the number one spot, um, and whichever one ends up with the number one spot is just going to be the one that signs later. Derwin James and Minka Fitzpatrick are both very high-profile players and big-time impact players, and both do a lot more in coverage than Jamal Adams does, which is where safeties tend to make their money. I think that if, as as good as he was with the Seahawks in his sort of blitzing role, if they did not shell out so much for him in the trade package, I do not believe that he would have made such a huge jump in the market. And to me, both Derwin James and Minka Fitzpatrick are more valuable players. Not that Adams isn't, but they just bring something different to the table. Something I consider to be more impactful. Um, So that's really where I am looking at the safety market as standing right now. Uh, If you are a Chargers or Steelers fan, be prepared for your teams to invest a lot at the safety position if they want to keep them around. Uh, And I think that's going to be the case for both of them. Um, and uh, if you're a Saints fan, I would be prepared to lose Marcus Williams. And Tyron Matthew, he may absolutely return to the Chiefs, but I have a suspicion that it would be he might sign a deal on the eve of free agency that's not as earth shattering as you know a lot of media speculation is going to be. A lot of people are looking at the Harrison Smith contract and saying, "Oh, it's uh, it." it the fact that he got this much means that Tyron Matthews is going to get so much. And 
Do I expect him to get more than Harrison Smith? Well, uh, yeah, I do expect him to get more than a one-year $15.3 million contract, you know, which is all that Smith really was guaranteed. So, um, but that's where I, where I see everything standing. So if you have any uh, comments or any questions about something that I said that I didn't fully explain or you, you know, disagree or anything, just uh, throw a comment down below. Uh, like if you appreciate the effort and subscribe because we'll be doing stuff like this all the time. So remember, I'm Max Dean and you can find me on Twitter at Pan Am Football. If you have any questions about the salary cap or you want to reach out and make some suggestions about what topics we do here at the channel, go for it. I'm absolutely open. And if you want to, you can find our Patreon, which is linked below, and you can vote every single week on which video topics we do. This video topic was voted by the patrons. Again, thanks to Scotty, our first ever patron. We will see you all very soon. Thanks.